Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, it's two minutes past two. We have about an hour to run through the first of a series of webinars from the Refresh European Communities project from the Horizon 2020 programme. Uh, we're here today to look at the adding value to food waste and byproducts part of the Refresh project, and particularly to discuss the use of the Refresh community of experts. And so this is the first of the, the series. Uh, I welcome you to our, our webinar today. There are three of us here to talk to you this afternoon. My name is Nina Sweet. I work for Rap Cymru, based in Cardiff in the UK. Dr Karen Lux is Head of Research at Feedback, and Dr Karen Ostergan, who is a Senior Researcher at RISE Agri-Food and Bioscience. We'll each cover different aspects of the Refresh project, but all of us focusing on the making better use of food and food waste through the food system. As a little bit of background to begin with, um, I hope that you are, because you've registered for this webinar, well aware of the of the Refresh programme as a whole. It has been a very large project and it's been running now for three years. We're in the final year of the dissemination of the many, many outputs that the project has generated. It was all about tackling action against food waste. So it does cover prevention, it covers supply chains, it covers the consumer. And as I say, this bit that we're talking about today is about making better use of the food that's unavoidably wasted. The project was very much about actively promoting collaboration in tackling food waste. We want to talk to you today about the, the Refresh community of experts and the platform that we've created that's there to share knowledge and best practice, enable replication of what's happened in the Refresh project elsewhere for partners outside the direct Refresh partnership programme. It has, the site itself holds a vast array of tools and resources which are all available now in an open form and it's very much about promoting cross-sector collaboration so that we can start to join up different bits of the food supply chain. As I say there were an enormous number of outputs from the Refresh project and we're still adding to this site now. Please go into the site and have a look. These are free access and easy to get to even if you don't want to join the community of experts. But I really would encourage you to do the latter and join. Come and join us in this community of experts that we have set up. It's a very simple process. It won't take you more than five minutes to do. If you create an account, it asks you to give us a little bit about a little detail about you, who you are and what you're working in and where your interests are. If you do that for us, it will give you the ability to upload any resources that you have and add to our community of experts resources. And you can have conversations with other members of the community and ask questions. You will have an individual profile page so people can see your interests. If you're looking for particular techniques or particular research needs, you can ask the questions in that, in that way. So it's very quick, it's very easy, and it's a very good place to start sharing the knowledge of what we are hoping will become quite normal activity to reuse wastes and resources properly. The website there is at the bottom of that, but as I say, I think we will repeatedly give that to you through this, um, this presentation this afternoon. This is the first, as I say, of the, the four webinars that we're running over the next month. So today we're doing adding value to food waste and byproducts. Tomorrow, if you're available, there is another one running on voluntary agreements and how to address food waste, passing on the knowledge that's been gained through the Refresh project. Tackling for consumer waste is at the end of the month after the Easter break. And lastly, but by no means least, measuring and managing retail food waste. All of these webinars will give you direct access to the refresh tools that have been generated. To look at today's agenda, what I'll do is just give you a very, very quick um, introduction to what we understand by adding value and valorisation of wastes. Dr Karen Lux will then talk about the potential barriers and opportunities that policy offers, particularly when we're looking at reusing food resources as animal feeds. And then Dr. Karen Ostergren will give us a, a quick run through the assessment tool and the recommended approaches that Refresh has generated in a tool, in a tool called Forklist. We will have time for questions. Um, 
maybe 10 minutes or so at the end. So please use the chat function that's on the, on the screen that I hope you can see in front of you. Please ask questions. We will try to answer as many as we can between us. And obviously, if there's stuff there that we can't answer, we'll, we'll stack them up and take them away and come, perhaps come back to you. And obviously, you can use that community of experts to answer those questions as well. So that's what we're about today. Um, what we need to do now is just, as I say, a very quick look at where the background of what we're trying to do with this particular aspect of this very big programme. Back in December last year, the EU, or October last year, the EU refreshed its bioeconomy strategy and called it a new bioeconomy strategy for a sustainable Europe. And what that did was set us out a really good background of which we're only quite a small part, but it is very important to remember that that small part is a very important cog in achieving the whole. The strategy set out some big objectives. It was all about creating jobs, healthy ecosystems, increasing carbon sink capacity, looking at biodegradable products and plastic substitutes, but importantly, using the added, added value and turning waste into added value products. Things that we are currently putting at the end of a linear economy to turn into a circular economy. So the bioeconomy is all about using more and using better biological resources to achieve our economic goals and sustainability. Excuse me. <coughs> a few numbers that go around that. Uh, again, these are from the EU, uh, not covering every single economy within the EU. Um, five countries listed in the first of those graphs. But you can start and see that we're talking about big numbers. This isn't a small part of our economy, really, but it is quite a hidden part of our economy. Many member states now have published bioeconomy strategies, each reflecting the bioeconomy in their own environments. For farming focused, industry focused, material focused, whatever works within the, in the local localised state economy. But in every single case, it is easy to show the financial, economic, sustainability, climate change benefits from making the bioeconomy work properly. And all of these strategies now set, it's got to be said, very ambitious goals and very, very, <coughs> excuse me. What they're looking to do is to start and change our economy from a fossil fuel based to a bio based one. To start to use resources and feedstocks that we grow, starches, oils, fats, mixed bio wastes, proteins, and turn them through into bio based intermediates, surfactants, chemicals, and through again into higher grade products to replace and make more circular the routes that we make in our supply chains. If we look particularly at food, we can start and see how important those, the volume here is. These are numbers from the UK generated by RAP and published in 2017. Now, uh, we gathered these from our partnership through the Court Old Commitment, a voluntary agreement that you'll hear talked about in the voluntary agreement webinar if you sign into that one. We're talking about large amounts of material being generated. Obviously, the first thing to do is prevent this loss, but if we can't prevent it, we can use those materials within the bioeconomy to make new products, new, new materials to make other things with, to increase their value and to stop disposing and burning. This is a graph that you might see two to three times throughout this webinar this afternoon. I've chosen to make my pyramid upside down. We're talking about valorization, which is a complicated work to say, making more use or making increasing the productivity of our resources, adding value. At the top of our hierarchy here is prevention. It has to be the best thing to not waste something in the first place, adds economic value into a business and reduces costs, as well as making the best use of that resource going forwards. And then obviously, if you can't eat the food directly and it can still be eaten, it should be eaten. So redistribution or sent for animal feed. Traditionally, recycling for organic materials like food has been done through composting, anaerobic digestion, which are worthwhile activities, 
But what we're talking about here is that gap in the middle. Is it possible to do something else between eating food and composting food, which gains extra value from it, but will still allow you to use any residual in further recycling technologies before you look at recovery, or God forbid, disposal? So what we're suggesting, perhaps, is an additional part of the waste hierarchy. If we can do that, we start to build value and my pyramid turns back up the right way again. Large volume, low value activities like heat and energy generation should be turned to bulk chemicals, bioplastics, foods and feeds, biopharma. If I have a slice of bread and I'm wasting it, in the worst case, it goes to a landfill. In the best case, it's turned into a pharmaceutical feedstock and a whole range of options in between. Chemicals, materials and fuels that displace fossil derived products. If we can do that, the costs and benefits are enormous. Corporate sustainability goals are met and we're turning our circular, our linear economy into a proper and working circular economy. A few examples of this in terms of transferring that directly to business. If I'm a business that wants to take this step, firstly, I identify my material flows through my business. I look to find out what my unavoidable materials might be, which will enable me to prioritise the valorisation hotspots. Where's the best thing that I can concentrate my investment effort at? And if I can do that, I can evaluate what I can do with it and turn loss into profit. At Rat Crumery, we've done this with four sectors. And I'll leave some links on the end of this set of slides to tell you where you can find the information that we've generated through this activity. We've looked at fresh produce, bakery, drinks and dairy. And for each one of those, we've looked at what's happened and how it works and where it gets to and what's produced. So in the dairy sector, milk, the priority whey stream would appear to be separated east large cheese, salty whey, cottage cheese, acid whey. And by running an options appraisal process, we are providing industry with a whole range of options to turn those current low value co-products into high value additional profit. An idealised version of this for the dairy industry illustrates the complexity of what we're perhaps talking about. Our simplistic li linear economy contains numerous routes. We put work in progress on this graph, a little tongue in cheek, but it really is. The more work we do, the better the solutions that we find. A slightly complex graphic, but uh, you'll find more information from that on the Rapcomry valorisation pages. We've accompanied that work with a small tool, which is really, really aimed at the, uh, the, the business itself. In providing the means for change, it's essential that a business understands the economic business case. Um, without knowing how soon investment can be returned and the value of that investment, no financial director will change the production stream. So our tool can lead to increased productivity and efficiency, higher product outputs and increased revenue for the company. And if you can tick those boxes, the finance director may come on board. One or two case studies where this is already happening, uh, large, larger global scale ones, Pasta manufacture being the residues being used with packaging, coffee being turned into numerous different products. Milk, um, a German company called Q-Milk is, is manufacturing really high quality usable fabric from milk proteins, previously all wasted. In Wales, we've done this with much smaller scale businesses because that is the nature of Welsh business. We are a very SME based community, working with distilleries, there is fruit farms and juice manufacturers. The juice manufacturer is a fantastic example. He was already using fruit not, not fit for supermarket use to produce a really good smoothie, high quality, high, high priced. Um, but he is now taking the pomace from that fruit manufacturer and producing other products from it by using our business tool and the oxygen appraisal tools to, to valorize, to make better use and give added value to his product. So this is, this is where you can find our resources, a shameless plug for, for At Cymru. Um, please, please use those. Please register for our easy to find more. 
but essentially please use the resources that are on the refresh website itself we'll make all of these things that i've spoken to here in the next few weeks available through the community of experts i hope and at that stage i think I'll hand over to karen lux who's going to talk to us about the policy landscape particularly around where it's relating to animal feed and the use of unavoidable food waste as an animal feed karen Okay, um, I hope everybody can hear me, see me, and the presentation. Okay, I'm assuming that if I'm not hearing anything, then that's... Yeah, okay, great. Um, thank you for inviting me to be part of this uh, webinar as well. So I'll just go straight into <clears throat> the presentation. Yeah, so um, I'm first having a quick overview of the um, policy landscape and I've used the food use hierarchy alongside here the um, supply chain in a simplified uh, way. And I first wanted to very briefly mention the uh, proposal of the European Commission for a directive um, on unfair trading practices in business to business relationships. Um, in the food supply chain and this is important in terms of prevention in the early stages of the supply chain so that for example um, there will be less uh, last minute order cancellations or alterations um, and we have less arbitrary application of cosmetic standards for example so letting more uh, fruit that isn't quite perfect into, into the supply chain for example when it's been um, related to an unfair trading practice I can tell you more about that if you're interested um, but that's not um, the detail of this presentation. Then the circular economy uh, package um, aims to half uh, per capita food waste and it focuses on the retail and consumer level in line with the sustainable development goal, 12.3. Uh, but it also has a um, commitment without target to reduce um, food waste further up the supply chain uh, as well. So in um, manufacturing and farming. Then uh, the then on the distribution or redistribution level for human consumption we have some national legislation for example in Italy and France and we know that the EU platform on food losses and food waste um, with uh, its working group on donation is trying to further this aspect in terms of policy as well. Then as part of the circular economy um, package the European Commission has developed um, guidelines on the use of former foodstuffs in feed, and I will come back to those um, a little, in a little while. Um, we also have the Renewable Energy Directive, which is actually um, something quite relevant and important to look at. Um, obviously, we know that it looks at preventing food waste from being landfilled or incinerated and rather be used as a bio uh, mass in energy generation as better than landfill or incineration. Um, but what we've noticed when looking at the directive is that it does not differentiate food waste from other types of bio waste or organic wastes, for example, um, garden waste. So that's something we can look at in terms of preventing um, edible um, food waste, if it's edible by, for animals or humans to prevent from it going down the hierarchy into recycling. Um, and we see that there is actually not yet any sustainability criteria for the use of um, food waste in anaerobic digestion. Um, and we've heard in Refresh, we've reported some anecdotal evidence of food fit for human consumption or animal consumption being drawn down the hierarchy. Um, and sustainability criteria do exist for other biomass, such as forest or food crop biomass. So we think something on um, food surplus should be done there as well. Uh, Karin will, um, in the later presentation, come back to where, in which circumstances, it might actually make sense to look at the hierarchy um, in a different way. Um, but she, she will explain that to you. And then, of course, there is the bioeconomy strategy, which um, Nina has already discussed. Now, I will focus in this um, presentation mostly on animal feed as a very interesting uh, way of adding value to surplus food that is no longer uh, fit for human consumption. And I first want to mention 
um, the sort of life cycle assessments that have already been done by various researchers to highlight why animal feed sits so high up in the hierarchy. And in this study, we can see that um, when surplus food is turned into wet liquid pig feed, it um, is more beneficial in all these environmental criteria compared to dry pig feed, but especially biogas and compost. Um, what we see here, what's reflected here in terms of uh, fossil fuel use is um, obviously in the dry pig feed, the drying, the processing of the feed, but also the proportion of renewables in your local energy mix. This was done on an average energy mix for the UK. So if we actually improve our energy mix and it's more renewable, then this becomes even more beneficial. And another part of that plays um, a part, um, a role in determining in how beneficial the environmental uh, um, benefits are from turning surplus food into feed depends on how far the distance is from your surplus food supplier to the processing plant to the farm. So um, what we've done to what we've uh, realized is that a lot of uh, businesses producing unavoidable surplus food um, do not always find it easy to navigate the legislation to make sure that what they have as surpluses can legally be used as food waste and how to do it, uh, sorry, as animal feed and how to do this safely. So we've developed this tool and what it does is it helps um, food businesses to navigate legislation from the perspective of the kind of um, food producer that you are. Um, yeah, and this is mostly for smaller businesses who may not have sort of in-house legal expertise to help uh, work this out. Um, and then it takes you through a whole uh, cascade of, of questions like, um, like this one, but there are many more detailed ones. So this is just an example. Please go to the tool on the community of experts if you want to work your way through, uh, through this particular tool. But one of the important questions is obviously, whether the food that you have contains any prohibited animal byproducts currently prohibited in, the, in animal feed, such as um, meat, fish, uh, raw eggs, ruminant gelatin, for example. Um, and if it doesn't, then great news. And if you can avoid um, your products being in contact with these prohibited uh, products, then your form of foodstuffs can be used as animal feed. And so we have a form of foodstuff processing industry that actually already turns 5 million tons of surplus bakery goods, for example, into feed. Um, then after we created this tool, the European Commission, as part of the um, circular economy package, came up with um, guidelines um, on the feed use of food no longer fit for human consumption. Um, these guidelines do not change the legislation, they clarify. And there were some things that were useful to clarify. For example, on the use by date, some member states would um, prohibit the use of, for example, yogurts, uh, one day past their use by date, could no longer be used in animal feed. And the legislation says actually, if the feed business operator can demonstrate that it is safe to use these yogurts in feed, then, then it's still, then that is okay. Um, likewise, in transport, we had an issue where in some member states, um, you could not transport surplus food for destined for animal feed in lorries that were used for other types of food that might may contain the prohibited products. And the commission has clarified in the guidelines, actually, the separate lorries is not necessary if you use separate containers that are adequately sealed and color coded and that is sufficient. Um, and there is also an exemption on the registration on the um, feed hygiene uh, legislation, but I won't go into that and people can ask me questions if they want to know more about that. Um, so <clears throat> what we have then done as Refresh is also look at what kind of food is leaving the food supply chain currently because legislation does not allow us to use it. So like I said before, if it contains meat. And the legislation in Europe, unlike most other parts of the world, does not differentiate between ruminant livestock such as cows or goats or sheep and omnivorous non-ruminant livestock such as pigs and chickens. Um, and like I mentioned before, we currently uh, process about 22 percent uh, or we, we can actually, if we make the best of the form of foodstuffs that are currently allowed to be used as feed, such as bakery goods, if we turn all of them um, into feed, we would use about 22% of our manufacturing, retail and food surface surplus food in feed. 
But if we were to change legislation and differentiate between uh, new ruminants and non-ruminants, we could actually process up to 52%, which is what Japan currently uh, processes into animal feed, and that would be an additional 14 million tons of food that could be used. Now, to do this, we have to um, look at, um, make sure that we do this safely, to not repeat um, what's happened in the past with um, the foot and mouth uh, crisis, and also to prevent the spread of African swine fever, which is currently um, uh, existing in, in Europe. So what we have looked at with different experts is how can this be done? And we absolutely need um, to only uh, take food surplus that has been processed in specialist licensed treatment facilities. So there would be no using of uh, you know, a pig farm going to collect food surplus from a restaurant directly because we couldn't ensure that that would be safe and that um, dangerous pathogens such as African swine fever, such as foot and mouth disease would be um, properly destroyed. So what we can see here is we need to have heat treatment um, and also acidification, which helps to um, destroy pathogens, but also um, acidification through fermentation has a lot of um, a lot of advantages, for example, and it's very well evidenced in terms of the reduction uh, of use of antibiotics in pig farming because of the probiotic, um, um, yeah, the probiotic nature of, of fermented feeds, for example, it can prolong its shelf life as well. We then need to prevent cross contamination uh, between the surplus food that has not yet been treated, if you like, the raw food waste and the um, food surplus that has been treated. And we can do this through applying strict biosecurity measures such as zoning, temperature monitoring, etc., um, as currently applied in the rendering sector. So we do not need to reinvent the legislation for that. <clears throat> so why would we bother trying to change legislation so that non-ruminants can have these other surplus foods that are currently prohibited in animal feed? Um, it's uh, the driver that, that drives us is the um, environmental benefits. There are also economic benefits, but I won't have time to go into that in this presentation. Um, the climate impact. So we did an analysis of um, all the available surplus food that would theoretically be suitable for feeding to pigs in France and UK and looked at what impact are we avoiding uh, by feeding these um, livestock with surplus, treated surplus food instead of conventional feed. And that's where the real avoided impact is, because in this orange box um, that relates to the production of conventional feed for uh, pigs. And that really means that you reduce demand on um, soya, which in Europe is still mainly imported from Brazil from Argentina with huge uh, impact on deforestation there. Um, and it also avoids um, using crops such as barley and wheat, which could be eaten directly by humans. So we kind of take away the competition between um, overfood crops and arable land between feed production and food production. So that's where a lot of the benefit lies. But we create some new environmental impact as well because we need to process the feed, we need to transport it. And we know that I mentioned before the collection of food waste in the transport distances create some new impact, but we have an overall beneficial net effect. We then extrapolated from our detailed studies in France and the UK just to get an idea. So this is a very much an approximate based on UK and France uh, market conditions of pig feed, pig farming and the available food waste. But then we came to this uh, figure for um, for Europe, so we would save 5.8 million tons of CO2 equivalent. And for people to have an idea of what that means, um, this would be around about taking 3 million passenger cars uh, off the road for a year in the UK, so British passenger cars. So it's quite a significant carbon saving. Mm -hmm. uh, then I wanted to finally mention um, an important topic that, that people often ask me about um, and that requires also a legislation change is that um, when we take mixed surplus food, especially from uh, food service from restaurants, hotels and so on, they may have some pork in them. And that would mean that we would have to change the intraspecies recycling ban for non-ruminants. And for this, I wanted to point to the scientific evidence. So we know that in the European Commission early scientific steering committee, but also later in a new European Food Safety Authority um, risk assessment, uh, they both confirmed that there is no evidence that um, 
interspecies recycling could cause transmissible spongiform encephalopathy in um, non-ruminants. Um, and the same was confirmed by a detailed study by DEFRA experts where BSE infected material was fed to pigs and then these pigs were kept for seven years and, and no um, BSE uh, was found in these pigs. Um, and <clears throat> this means that actually in um, other countries, Australia, New Zealand, Japan, US, there is no interspecies recycling ban for non-ruminants. So um, Europe is exceptional in this. And people who are worried about the kind of the ethical um, um, aspects of this question, I want to point to, if you look at the scientific literature on this, you say that interspecies um, recycling is observed in over 1,300 species from fish to insects and mammals. It's not seen as an aberrant behavior limited to confined or highly stressed populations, but a normal response to many environmental factors. Um, and if you look at existing research on nutrition, pig nutrition in countries outside um, Europe, then you see that um, interspecies recycling is just not an issue in, in other countries. And I've spoken to pig welfare campaigners in Europe, uh, veterinarians and welfare experts, all these Europeans, yes. And they all agree that there is no problem. In fact, they agree that having animal proteins in the feed may actually improve welfare by reducing stress-induced cannibalism, such as tail biting and ear biting. So um, yeah, that's the kind of the proposal that Refresh has been working on and which we're now putting to different industry um, sectors and government sectors to debate further because of all the environmental benefits that it would bring. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. We'll hand over now to Karen Ostergren. Okay, Karen, it's all yours. Good afternoon, everybody. I hope you can hear and see well. And I'm very happy to have got the opportunity today to share some of the work done in Refresh on assessing environmental and economic benefits of different virilization options of site flows. Okay, very seldom uh, we use complete raw material for food, site flows that need to be taken care of in a better way. It's a key challenge for the food industry to maximize the value of site flows in a sustainable way. The food use hierarchy that you see here provides some guidance, but not always the full picture for a given situation. To illustrate the challenges, let's look at the example of valorization of apple pomas. Next slide. Apple pomas is a residue from use of cider production. One kilo one kilo of apple pomas uh, gives 0.7 kilogram juice and 0.3 gram pomas. In EU, about 2.5 million tons of apple are utilized for juice and cider per year, which means that you have roughly 0.7 million tons of apple pomas to take care of. Please. And uh, the relevant question is now how to valorize apple pomas in the best way. Could it be? pectin, a valuable food additive, or making biogas, or feed for cows, or maybe spread it on land to add moisture to improve the soil. The food use hierarchy, next slide please, uh, is one way to get an idea, but it does not really answer the key question. Most practitioners aim for making good business and being sustainable. At the same time, Thus, the key question to consider becomes, how does the current handling of apple pomas compare to other options? Next slide, please. Um, and then you need to com consider environmental impacts, cost and mark as well. Now it starts to getting tricky. In Refresh, we have developed, created a science-based tool for practitioners to help out. The name of the tool is the forklift tool. Forklift stands for food use, food site flow recovery, life cycle tool. And it is a spreadsheet tool. Next slide, please. Forklift aims at providing stakeholders with hands-on, helping to gain a general understanding and highlight the environmental impacts and costs for selected valorization routes 
focusing on selected key parameters. The foods that are covered in the tool are apple pomace, lard from slaughtering, brewer spent grain, tomato pomace, whey parameate, and rapeseed press cake. As you can see, we have built forklift models for a selection of common side flows from the food industry. The choice of side flows implemented in forklifts were actually based on recommendations by experts and stakeholders within Refresh, fulfilling the criteria of being difficult to prevent, being of large volumes or having significant environmental impacts, and having a high valorization potential compared to now. Forklift uses a life cycle uh, approach. That means that it calculates the environmental impacts from cradle to grave. In this case, we use the global warming potential together with all costs. In this case, the real money flows associated with the life cycle of the product. How does forklift work? Um, forklift models processing options, greenhouse emissions and generic costs for one ton of flow. Actual costs of labor and equipment can be added. Forklift contains background data on greenhouse gas emissions and costs, transport and processing for European countries. And uh, these parameters can also be partly modified. And the impacts are split between the main product and the side flow based upon the value. And that is called in LCA langu language economic allocation. Finally, uh, the modeled results can be compared with the results with similar products that are on the market to give you a view if your process is beneficial or not. This is a snapshot of how far forklift looks. When you open the model, you select a side flow. In this case, between production, feed, big digestion, or land spread. And below you see the different products that are modeled. So if you choose anaerobic digestion, we're entering a new page uh, that looks like this. And to the left, there is a brief uh, process description, the graphs and, and the graphs here shows the costs in blue and the green are the greenhouse gas emissions from the processes. The gray bars shows the comparing products and we will have a look, closer look at them in a few minutes. In addition, as a reference, the impact of one kilo of apples and the footprint of one EU citizens is provided in the graphs to give you a feeling if it's big or small. And if you would like to split the cost between the main products and the side flows by economic allocation, you provide the value of the side flow and its relative value to the products of the same side flow. This is done in the input section at the top. Uh, further, you can change country. Uh, you can change details in the process itself and you could add labor and capital costs. And now let's look a bit closer to the biogas production for heat in combination with electricity. Uh, we start looking at Estonia. The green is the current process compared to the impact of heat and electricity in average from Estonia hydropower, electricity and heat average in Europe, and electricity and heat in Europe, and uh, the addition of application of mineral fertilizer, and that connects to the digestate that is produced when you have the making anaerobic digestion. So in this case, it looks quite good. It's a good option, it's better than the other options. But let's have a look at Norway. If you compare with the Norwegian electricity, you see it's not really a good option. And that depends on uh, that in Norway, most electricity is based on hydropower. Thus, we clearly see that the local and regional conditions matters 
and in forklift you can play around with these conditions to understand what matters in your situation. And next slide. This is an example of how you can use forklift to compare different options more in a more broad way. In this set of calculation, baseline is a European average electricity and light fuel as energy source for heat. Further, the market conditions of the products are considered to be constant. So, uh, the, these positive dark gray uh, bars show the impact of the process itself. Uh, this dashed bar uh, show the impact of the product assumed to be taken away from the market. And this black line shows the net effect of a change. So this is how to read this diagram. And here you could see the valorization of the pectin. And here we have modeled the, the valorization for cow feed and for the mixture of heat and city. And here is Norway, and here is Estonia, and here is disposal land spread. And as you could see, in this case, for this data set, at least if you are in Estonia, this is the best option. And biogas seems to be a good option for the European cases as well, but feed, is not a bad option either, but for the current data set, uh, pectin is not as good because the energy, these are energy requiring process. If you have uh, a clean energy, this will come out much better. So this is an example how you can use forklift to identify options to find hotspots. So in conclusion, uh, the food use hierarchy is a good way of understanding roughly how to think. Forklift is a good starting point for understanding the process in its context and a first step for making informed decisions how to improve. For decisions on investments and communication, full LCAs and LCCs should be performed. As was done, for example, for the feed case that Karen showed in the, uh, in the previous presentation. So if you are a little bit curious of forklift and want to try out, you could download the spreadsheets and the documentation on the refresh website. And I think also now or very shortly from the community of experts. And also if you would like to perform a combined LCA and LCC, guidance are provided uh, as well in reports that are on the refresh. So please take your time and have a look at uh, these reports. Thank you. Thank you very much, Karen. Step back into some screens. Oops. We have the opportunity to take some questions. Um, and thank you to those of you who have uh, been feeding those through to us. Um, I'm going to start perhaps with a couple for Dr. Lux. Uh, we have some questions on the potential of the use for animal feed, Karen. Um, I know Refresh didn't particularly address animal, sorry, sorry for insect feed, um, particularly look at, at insects, but I think we're all aware that it is a growing sector. Um, our questions around the uh, the flow diagram for former food stuff doesn't include an option for insect farmers at the moment yeah and the law yeah. is obviously very different for pigs than it is for say black soldier flies interestingly um, it actually isn't so the law um in terms of what can currently be fed uh, what it prohibits to be fed to livestock is also prohibited to feed to um insects currently 
So you're still excluding, say, household mixed food waste cannot currently be fed to insects legally in, in Europe, even though a lot of um, research is being done. So that's one thing that we need to be changed. And in our big report, I forgot to mention that will be published within the next few weeks on the Refresh Results website, we actually refer to some of the research done on, um, on insects, and it depends a lot on the situation. Um, the important thing to note is that insects in an EFSA, the European Food Safety Authority, has done an, an opinion on this. Insects are not necessarily going to um, prevent the path dangerous pathogens from being passed on. So you still need the heat treatment of the food waste, just as I showed for directly feeding to pigs. You still need the same heat treatment if you were going to feed it via insects. Now, um, that doesn't mean insects can't play a role, and then it depends very much on what you... Uh, feed the insects where they um, sending surplus food through insects or direct direct feeding becomes more beneficial or not. And there's some interesting new research coming out from Wahini, which we will be referring to in the report as well. But there are circumstances in which from an energetic or environmental perspective from the LCAs that have been done to date, it is more beneficial to feed directly um, to pigs. So it's kind of a the insects aren't the magic bullet, but can play a role in, in overall pr protein production. Thank you, Karen. And a sort of um, supplementary to that one, um, a, a quick question about, is it possible to standardise the feed for insects in any way, so that there are standards and you know what you're taking? Uh, for insects or for the pigs? For, for insect feed. But for animal feed, obviously, um, you have yeah. to meet a certain standard. That doesn't exist for for insect feed. Do you see yeah. that coming? Um, yeah, I don't know. No, I'm, I'm not sure. I think it took. It was a very narrow path in the European Parliament for the approval for insects to be used as um, uh, that. You know the. Um, yeah, the permission for insects to be used in animal feed was only very narrowly passed. Now, in terms of what the standards are for what they feed be fed on, if we change that from what's currently permitted, I don't know what where that is at because we haven't researched that particular part. Okay. Well, that's an area for more work. Yeah. And then perhaps a question for both of you, um, and that you've been more involved in the work of Refresh than, than I have. How replicable do you think the findings of Refresh will be to other parts of the world? And are these tools easy to pick up and use elsewhere, outside Europe? Either of you? Uh, yeah, so um, on the so the animal feed tool, the, le the legislative one that we've done wouldn't be applicable because that's very specific on European legislation. The um, work we've done in terms of if we were to change legislation for non-ruminant, uh, feed, then the research we've done is very relevant because we've taken the Japanese model, which is already uh, being implemented, but we've looked at a higher risk context like the European context um, and, and kind of developed a model from a safety perspective, you know, gone into the detail. And we think that there's a lot of mileage there because in the United States, for example, some states permit the use of um, surplus food as animal feed, but they permit the on farm processing, which, you know, there are more risks and I think sort of doing it in a, um, manage the risks adequately, this model, uh, I think is is repl replicable. Uh, we've, we're in, we've already been dialoguing, for example, with the Australian government about, about the model, who get, they're very interested in it. So I think um, it is replicable and um, also worth noting again that in a very recent report, and I need to go and look it up, um, the Food and Agriculture Organization has again noted the importance of starting to look at the industrial uh, you know, high-scale high processing of surplus food for animal feed if we're going to move to a more sustainable uh, food system. So, yeah, okay. contribution and there. Dr. Gundry, the, the forklift tool, how replicable and how useful is that elsewhere? Uh, I would say that the work we have done with LCA and LCC, the build on uh, the U European guidance document, uh, the ELCD has and the guidance document and LCC. So they have uh, rigorously been built up and that means that it should be applicable, applicable anywhere. Of course, you may need to change some of the energy mixes and country mixes, but those you, you can change. So uh, okay. I would say they are quite easily, uh, can be 
uh, used okay. in other countries and replicated. Okay. And a, a follow up to that, um, one of our audience is asking about uh, citrus waste. And is it possible to have the model run for citrus valorization? Uh, most likely. And actually, in the documentation, uh, we have documented the uh, uh, citrus waste, common secrets citrus waste side flows uh, but for different reasons we choose that we implemented the apple pomace case so actually if you're with excel and um, you could probably work it out and do it within the frames that are there okay okay so perhaps our advice would be for the questioner to join the community of experts and perhaps ask for the right right numbers to fill in to run the model or use the yes tool. Read it up. Yes, read the documentation and also get in contact to uh, see how the spreadsheet works and then you, it's easy to uh, implement a similar model and a similar thinking. Thank you. And uh, that's nearly, nearly a last one, but uh, for, for, for all of us, um, we're talking about the use of biomass and the use of feed. How do we avoid the, the race and the competition? And how do we make the best choices for, for different materials going forwards? Um, without getting into all the details of food versus fuel, are we talking about food versus other things now? Um, yeah, so what, what we've done is, as, as a theoretical framework to our work, there's um, a, a research group at Wageningen University and they're working on, uh, you could call it the ecological leftover model, but there, there's, a, there's other names to it as well, where you limit your um, globally in sort of a global sustainable diet rather than saying that the vegan diet is the most, um, the most environmentally friendly diet, in fact. The, the latest research shows that if you were to limit your livestock production to only that which is produced from unavoidable byproducts and unavoidable surplus food, then in some marginal grasslands you could bring in for dairy uh, production then you actually have a less land use than for a vegan diet because you're not you are not taking these unavoidable byproducts out of the food supply chain and you're keeping them in there but you would and we've, we've actually calculated this is in our report as well quite interesting so for for france for example if we were to use all of theoretically available surplus food, currently leaving the food supply chain, but turn it into pig feed, then there would be enough um, uh, pig meat uh, or like a sort of a pork chop of 100 grams per person per week. Um, so, you know, there, there is, <laughs> yeah, no, and, and this is done on, on quite detailed research on what is the energy content and the lysine, which is the most um, limiting amino acid in a big diet and often needs to be added. So you can look at that in the, in the detailed um, LCA study that will soon be published on the refresh results. But I think um, it's, it's a very important question and we really need to guard um, because I'm just trying to see, look at the question here, you know, the race for biomass production, I think, is a, a really important one that we need to keep framing our work in to not drive the wrong uh, kind of, um, or, you know, have un unintended knock-on effects that, yeah. Thank you. I think, uh, I think my summary to that was it's complicated, but we are at least trying to address some of the questions now. I think that is all we've got in terms of questions online. Um, I think if it's okay, with my fellow panelists, I'll try and wrap up now. Um, as I said at the beginning of this, there is a vast array of resources available on the Refresh website. And if you join the community of experts, it gives you the ability to add to that knowledge, use that knowledge and ask questions of that knowledge. So please, please do that. And the forklift tool that Dr. Ostergren uh, Mench talked about is is available there as well. Um, please have a an explore and a play with it. Um, and while it's up there on online, please ask any questions that you can or need to to make use of it. I'm sure the the researchers will in turn welcome the feedback from from its use. So I think um, that's all we have to say to you in terms of the time that we've got allowed to us this afternoon. We said we would try and finish this within the hour. Um, 
I've just seen that one more question has come in. We will try and address that perhaps offline and send something back to the uh, to, to the participant in that case. Uh, sorry, I was getting distracted. Thank you very much for your attention this afternoon. Um, I hope that you have found what we've presented here very useful. Um, I think it is only a taster of the information that's available from this project and that will be available through the community of experts if we all contribute the, the knowledge, experience, case studies and business experience that we all own towards that. We will move to a point where this type of uh, business behaviour will become the norm in the future. It is the future for a circular economy. So thank you for your attention and I wish you a good afternoon. Thank you.